Hello. So in this video, as part of my 2021 Halloween series, we're going to talk about Carl Freund's 1932 film, The Mummy. Now, this is one of my favorite of the classic Universal Monster movies. Um, and actually, the 1999 remake with Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz uh, is one of my favorite movies, full stop. And those of you who are particularly clever may have noticed that I am dressed as everyone's favorite uh, destructive of libraries librarian. So, the 1932 version of The Mummy uh, stars Boris Karlov in the titular role. Um, and it's, for those of you who, who, like me, sort of grew up with the 1999 Mummy film, there's actually a lot that's, that's similar, but there's a, there are several significant differences as well um, from the 1999 version. So, the... The basic plot line of the 1932 film is uh, that there's a dig in Egypt in 1921, and they have found a mummy, an unusual mummy, in an unusually good state of preservation. They've also found a box with that, that purports to hold the Scroll of Tot, or Tot, as he's it's sometimes called. Um, tot is the, the the pronunciation that I'm going to use. Um, so we have the Scroll of Tot, which is supposed to contain the magical incantations used by the goddess Isis to resurrect Osiris. Uh, this is a fundamental component of Egyptian mythology, the resurrection of Osiris, uh, who then... Uh, who, who had been murdered by his brother Set um, and gets avenged by Horus, uh, Osiris' son, and all this is peripheral to the movie. But the key component is that in the myth, Osiris is resurrected and he becomes a god of the underworld. And this scroll, the scroll of Tot, Tot being um, a god of wisdom, of scribes, and a sort of culture hero of, of ancient Egyptian knowledge. I'm hashtag Team Tote, by the way. Um, this scroll purports to contain the secret incantations that raised Osiris from the dead, and which can be used to raise others from the dead. Uh, the Egyptologists, the archaeologists who have discovered this scroll, there's sort of main seasoned uh, archaeologist there's the young rookie archaeologist and then there's a folklorist slash occultist who basically comes along and is like don't read from the scroll uh in a bizarre way he's the egyptologist from the 1999 film who says you must not read from the book uh except in this version uh, the occultist is much wiser and much less like, yeah, let's dig up stuff we shouldn't be digging up and open chests we shouldn't be opening. Because uh, he is, in fact, taking the exact opposite position. But the young, impetuous Egyptologist, despite being told not to do so, reads part of the Scroll of Tote, which brings the mummy back to life and that drives the young Egyptologist to insanity. Cut to, uh, I think it's eleven years later, because I think they set, I, th I think they set it in act actually in 1932, uh, in the same year that the movie came out. Terrifying. Um, there's another uh, excavation. They haven't found anything. When. A tall, mysterious, suspiciously mummified-looking Egyptian shows up, claiming to be named Ardeth Bey. Oh, incidentally, uh, the mummy they they learn was named Imhotep, 
and he was supposed to have been um, a sort of high priest um, who who basically committed some sort of blasphemous act. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what it is because it's actually been a little while since I watched this movie. Um, I think basically the gist of it is that uh, his lover died and he attempted to resurrect her and they were like, nah, son, that's not cool. Um, so he gets buried in basically the, the scroll of Tote with this uh, secret of resurrecting the dead gets buried with him so that no one else will be able to do it, etc. So anyway, 1932. Um, this guy named Ardeth Bay, uh, who looks, again, suspiciously like the mummy from the first scene, uh, shows up and he's like, Hey, uh, I hear you guys haven't found anything. Well, would you like to find a fabulous coffin and a bunch of stuff? And they're like, yeah, that sounds great why don't you dig it up? And he's like, because we Egyptians are not allowed to dig up our dead, which is total bullshit, by the way. Um, Egyptian archaeologists and Egyptologists are among the most important uh, archaeologists working today in Egypt. So clearly that's not true. Uh, it's some sort of weird ruse that Ardeth Bey decides to come up with so that these Egyptologists will dig up the grave of Anaksun Namun, um, who, is, who was Ardeth Bey's beloved. So they do that. And they take her to the museum in Cairo, where Ardeth Bey then shows up. And he's like, oh, great, you guys dug her up. That's awesome. And they're like, yeah, thanks. You totally like saved our butts on, on this trip. Why don't you come to our party and hang out? And he's like, eh, I don't know if I want to. I'd rather stay here in this museum by myself at night with this mummy. And they're like, a little weird. Don't really want you doing that. But you know what? Eh, we got the mummy because of you. So stay as long as you want. Ardeth Bay does stay. He stays actually after the museum closes, hiding out in a corner or something. And then... Uh, he attempts to use the scroll of Tote to resurrect Anaxu Namun, which does not work initially. He then gets sort of caught by a security guard whom he kills, um, but he loses the scroll. Uh, so the, uh, the occultist gets hold of the scroll because he's still sort of hanging around. Um, so he gets hold of the scroll and basically takes it home. And we have a young lady named Helen Grovesner, who is uh, the ward, uh, I think ward is the proper term, of uh, this occultist, whose name I don't remember. I'm just going to keep calling him the occultist. I'm sorry. Um, so she's her his ward. Ardeth Bay shows up at their house because um, he wants his scroll back, basically, and, like, he's been drawn to it. And this is one of the interesting things that the movie, uh, the 1932 Freund movie, does that the 1999 film doesn't really do. Um, Ardeth Bay mesmerizes the Nubian servant. So they, the, the occultist has this um, sub-Saharan black African servant again it's the early 30s so as problematic as that is it was not necessarily seen as that problematic in the 30s but uh, Ardeth Bay basically hypnotizes this guy and puts him under puts the servant under his command he also more or less hypnotizes Helen Grovesner, or mesmerizes Helen Grovesner, whom he, whom Ardeth Bey slash Imhotep slash the Mummy 
believes is the reincarnation of Anaxuna Moon. Uh, and so ultimately what he what he sort of plans to do is to take her back to the museum and sacrifice Helen Grovesner so that Anaxun Namun can live again. This doesn't go entirely to plan, in part because um, the occultist, he doesn't necessarily figure out entirely what's going on, but he develops a pretty good idea. Um, and he starts fighting against Ardeth Bay's power over Helen, and he starts trying to figure out ways to undermine his ability to resurrect Anaxunamu. In a way, this is a lot like um, Van Helsing in the 1931 Dracula film. The roles are very, very similar here. So there's some interesting stuff going on in this film. And then ultimately sort of the climax is that um, Ardeth Bay gets Helen Grovesner into the museum. She's mesmerized. He's going to sacrifice her. Um, but the occultist shows up and he basically is like, he basically like calls on the gods of ancient Egypt and their statues in the museum to strike down uh, Imhotep, which is, I mean, that's the end of the movie, basically. And that's that's how it goes. So there's some interesting stuff going on with the film. One is this idea of mesmerizing people, this idea that, that Imhotep or Ardeth Bey can sort of control people. And, and I mean, Boris Karloff has that stare. He has that stare that, that you can definitely see how it's in the vein of mesmerism. But it's an interesting plot device because you have a lot of other films in the 20s and 30s that are really, really interested in this idea of hypnotism and controlling people against their will. Again, we saw it in Dracula. Um, we also see it in films like like the German Expressionist film from, I think, 1922, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is about a, uh, a hypnotist who controls people and basically gets them to sleepwalk and do his bidding. Um, we've got the first zombie movies that come out. The first sort of major zombie movie was The White Zombie. Um, which I think is early 30s as well, but I'm, I don't remember the year on that off the top of my head. Um, but again, we've got this idea of like, you can put people under your control and, and make them do things that they would not otherwise do. And this is a very terrifying idea in the 20s and 30s. People are, are like, this is showing up all the time in horror movies and German expressionist films and things like that. So that's a very interesting component um, because Ardeth Bay manipulates a number of people, especially the servant and Helen Grovesner, and he gets them to kill for him. So we've got that, that element of it. Um, another interesting thing is that this is a film that in a way comes out of the Egyptomania craze of the 1920s and 30s, right? Because in 1922, Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon discovered the tomb of King Tutankhamun, uh, which was the only tomb, I think still to this day, the only royal tomb that's ever been found that was not robbed out by grave robbers in the ancient world. And so that caused a sensation, especially in Britain and and Western Europe and the US. Um, people went mad for Egyptian stuff or Egyptian-ish stuff. Um, and so that was really, really culturally significant at the time. Uh, the importance of Egyptian culture and stuff like that. So 
Because, I mean, it's a weird thing. Like, prior to... Really, like, pro before World War One, for instance, people kind of didn't know what to do with ancient Egyptian artifacts. Like, there was... There was archaeology and stuff like this, but it was very, like, rudimentary. Stuff wasn't documented properly. And there was a period, I think, in, like, the 1880s where they just had more mummies than they knew what to do with. Like, they were just finding tons and tons and tons of mummies, and they were like, we've got we've got thousands of mummies. Fucking can't move for the them. So they were doing all kinds of weird stuff with them. Like... Like, they would sell mummies as, like, firewood, or they would, like, turn them into table decorations, or, like, uh, like you'd get a mummified foot as a paperweight or something like this. Like, it was really weird stuff. Um, when you think about the fact that these are actual human remains, um, and that they're archaeological discoveries, but um, the... Possibly more than any other single event, the discovery of Tut's tomb really changed that. Um, and people started to become very interested in Egyptology as a science and as a as a as a discipline that sort of required rigor and study and understanding. And so in 1932, when this film comes out. You're still in that Egyptomania craze. You're still in that period where people are really fascinated by mummies and ancient Egypt and things like this. And so you get some sense of the emerging scientific culture of archaeology um, as, it, as it begins to evolve into the discipline and the scientific practices that we know today. Um, like when the uh, young archaeologist at the beginning wants to just sort of crack open the chest and read read the scroll and things like this and the older archaeologist is like no we need to we need to like document everything we need to write everything down we need to draw sketches of everything we need to we need to make sure that everything we find is properly recorded and cataloged so again we get that emerging discipline of um, of archaeology and of, and of Egyptology uh, that today is much more fully developed, obviously. The other thing that I think is really interesting about this film is that they choose the name Imhotep for the mummy, because there actually was a famous Imhotep in ancient Egypt. Uh, he was an architect uh, who, during the, the reign of Pharaoh Djoser, um, and now Pharaoh Djoser is, a, is an important guy because he's the first one who created a pyramid not like a, a great pyramid by the this, not in the way that we tend to think of Egyptian pyramids he created a step pyramid because prior to Djoser um, Egyptian tombs were basically sort of square like they were they were square buildings um and what joser did was he stacked a bunch of those on top of each other getting smaller and smaller so it's a step pyramid um and imhotep is the one who designed this he's the one who came up with the idea of the step pyramid um, and then that sort of evolves into what we think of as the egyptian pyramids particularly uh, the pyramids of, of people like khufu uh, so the, the Great Pyramid at Giza and things like this come from this initial innovation that's at least attributed to Imhotep. And then Imhotep himself actually gets deified when he dies. Like, he's, he's one of the very few human beings in Egyptian mythology <clears throat> who becomes a deity over time. Um, and so that's, that's important because... Ardeth Bey has these sort of mystical powers and he's associated with the supernatural. And so in that sense, we have an Egyptian, a mummified Egyptian 
who's returning after death to have these supernatural abilities in the same in somewhat the same way that Imhotep returns after his death to be a god to be to be supernatural <laughs> uh, and so there's this interesting sort of parallel there but it's also in a way a very dark and and debatably racist parallel in the sense that the deification of an Egyptian is here linked with a profound evil, something profoundly unholy uh, that it, that uh, kills several people and and tries to sacrifice Helen Grosvenor. So, in that sense, there's a bit. I mean, it's it's a racist component in the sense that it says, oh, the ancient Egyptians, they were evil and, or they, their gods were evil and their religion was, was all pagany and destructive and whatnot. Um, and so in that sense, it's not a great message, but I think it's a great film.